quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. So Lindsay and I watched the HBO documentary about Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. Oh, right. What did you think? I thought it was amazing. I I could do a little less with Ethan Hawke, but <laughs> I love you, Ethan Hawke, but I really wanted to learn more about, about Paul and Joanne's marriage, and it was fascinating, and I highly recommend it. Absolutely. Tell me your thoughts. Well, you know, I agree with you 1,000%. Like, I didn't really care what Ethan Hawks and his celebrity friends thought about Joanne and Paul. I wanted to hear the story of Joanne and Paul. I wanted to see the home movies. I wanted to hear from the daughters. That's what interested me. And that's what was so good about that documentary. And you have a personal connection. I do. It's it's slight and it's fleeting, but I actually got to meet um, Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman um, back in 2000. I have a great friend, a wonderful actress named Allison Mackey, who um, she was sort of discovered by Joanne and Paul. She went to Kenyon College, which is where Paul went, and she and our other great friend, Allison Janney, were co-eds there, and Paul and Joanne took them under their wings, and when they moved to New York, they really, really looked out for them, and they, wow. they stayed lifelong friends. But Allison Mackey was appearing in a play in 2000 at the Westport Country Playhouse in Connecticut. The play was directed by Joanne Woodward. And the play was um, The Constant Wife. It was very good. Allison Mackey, you rocked. Uh, but at the opening night, which is where I was, I got to meet Joanne and I got to meet Paul, which was a thrill. Oh, I can't even. I, I think I would have been like I am right now, tongue, 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 tongue tied. <laughs> oh, I, I was totally, totally starstruck. And I, I don't get too starstruck, but those two, I mean, it was luminous what was coming at you from them. I mean, Joanne just, she had this inner glow I can't even explain. But the, the great thing about Paul is um, he wasn't as tall as I thought he was going to be. Okay. But he was sort of like a dad at a backyard barbecue at this opening. He literally walked around with a beer. He made sure everybody had what they needed and was, was taken care of. But he just knew how to pull back and let Joanne shine that night because oh, it was her night. And wow. he knew it. That's wonderful. And I love that that dynamic. Yeah. And that documentary really showed as you as you've talked about before, a real marriage, not a marriage that's perfect, certainly a marriage that must have been a challenge at times for both of them. Absolutely. I think people think they had that perfect marriage and I love that they showed warts and all. Yes. That's that's what real marriage is about. Yes. We we all those of us who've been married a while, which we both have, yeah, yeah. we know it's it's not all sunshine and buttercups every day. Right. <laughs> not well, even Paul and Joanne. Yeah. And and I think as we'll talk about in this episode, you know, actors get together, these passionate people, and they fall in love and you never know what's gonna happen. Yes. Well you know, it's funny because I, I think there's just this web of love in old Hollywood that just connects everybody. You could probably connect the dots to any two given stars by who they either dated, married, or screwed. (laughs) Okay, then let's just get into the nitty gritty right now. Who do you want to start with? Well, the first one that comes to mind is Lana Turner. Oh. How can you not with Lana Turner? Uh, It's funny, my dear friend Ann Rutherford, who I think I mentioned on our last episode, was probably the reason I came to Hollywood. Um, she told me one time that Lana was completely misunderstood. You know, people thought that Lana was easy because she married so much and she had so many romances. But Anne said, to the contrary, that Lana was an old-fashioned girl. And if you wanted to sleep with Lana, you had to marry Lana. Wow. <laughs> and apparently there were a lot of people who wanted to sleep with Lana. <laughs> well, she, she was, was a beautiful woman. And she was married seven times. So. She was married seven times. <laughs> Actually, eight ceremonies because she had to marry her second husband, Stephen Crane, twice. Because when she first married him, he, oopsie, wasn't quite not married from his first wife. <laughs> okay, so that one didn't really count. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, Lana, she she loved a lot. Um, you know, her first husband was Artie Shaw, with the great band leader who everybody knows. Who, and who will pop up a little bit later in this episode. Because he had his own little, you know, love web, too. But, you know, she met 
Artie Shaw. Um, interestingly, he was a total rebound. She was dating uh, Playboy and celebrity lawyer Greg Baltzer, and Baltzer stood her up for a date. And so Artie he stood up Lana he Turner. Stood up Lana Turner. Artie Shaw just happened to call that night and asked her out, and she didn't even like him. When she met him on the um, set of uh, Dancing Co-Ed, she thought he was arrogant. She didn't like him, but she was so heartbroken over Greg standing her up, she agreed to go out. Well, apparently it went well (laughs) because the date ended with them jumping a plane to Las Vegas, eloping and getting married that night. See, that's what I wanted Lindsay to do after our first date, and he just wouldn't. So what are you going to do? Only in Hollywood. Only in Hollywood. Okay, so they get married. How long does that last? Oh, it was short. I'm sure. uh, You know, Shaw was an intellectual guy. I mean, he, he wanted to basically make Lana his Pygmalion. He wanted her to read Shakespeare and discuss politics and all these heady intellectual things. Lana was 19 years old. She just wanted to go to Ciro's and dance and drink and party with her friends. Yeah, so, and become a movie star. Exactly. So it was short-lived. I, I think they were married a few months, and then they separated, and, and that was it. Uh, but, you know, Shaw, you know, not to be discouraged, went on to marry four more times. Okay. <laughs> he married, you know, he had married some good people. He married Betty Kern, who was the daughter of um, songwriter Jerome Kern. He married Ava Gardner, who was one of Lana Turner's closest friends, and we'll get the Ava later, but he married, you know, Kathleen Windsor, who was the author of Forever Amber, and he married um, Evelyn Keyes, who also starred in Gone with the Wind with Anne Anne Rutherford Rutherford. as the other sister, I'm sorry, Sue Ellen, which actually I I could get off on Evelyn Keyes a little bit too. She also married four times, you know, John (laughs) Huston, Charles Vidor, and she was in a long-term relationship with Mike Todd, the producer, who left her for Elizabeth Taylor. So are you you catching all that? We kind of need like a flow chart, um, but it's a podcast. And that is the web of love (laughs) in Hollywood. That's how connected it is. Tell me about Lana's second husband, because there's some drama there with the daughter that they ended up having. There is. And, you know, as I mentioned, you know, she had to marry him twice because he wasn't quite divorced from his first wife. It was a short marriage. They did have a daughter, Cheryl, who actually is a big player in an event that later happens with Lana, but it was a short-lived marriage. But they did have Cheryl Crane, their daughter, Lana's only daughter, who comes into play much later in a very scandalous, infamous episode with Lana's mobster boyfriend, Johnny Stampanato. But we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So husband three is a millionaire named Henry J. Topping Jr. Yeah. And and he kind of came and went. (laughs) He was just, you know, he was a tin plate heir. You know, the only interesting thing about him was his brother, Dan, once owned the New York Yankees. And after he divorced Lana, he married his former sister-in-law, who was married to Dan, Arlene Judge, who was also a, a movie actress. So Again, all the, all the, connections. the connections. Tell us about Lex Barker, who's husband number four. Well, hubby number four was quite a... <laughs> He was something. Um, you know, I don't know if people remember him now, but he played Tarzan on in the movies. He was sort of after Johnny Weissmuller, but he was a beefcake star. You know, not a great actor, but, you know, this, this good-looking, virile, handsome man. You know, Lana fell under his spell, and uh, so they, they were married rather quickly. Previously, he had been uh, married to actress Arlene Dahl, oh. who, yeah, who would later marry the uh, Latin heartthrob Fernando Lamas, who would have a long-term relationship with Lana, and then go on to marry America's favorite mermaid, Esther Williams. <laughs> and did they all stay friends during all of this? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I doubt it. I doubt it, right? Yeah. Could you imagine being at that cocktail party with all the exes? and? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think there'd be a lot of spilled bourbon or something. Yeah. But the, the worst part about Lex Barker is, you know, Cheryl Crane, in her autobiography, she said that he allegedly molested her. And supposedly, uh, when she finally told Lana about the, you know, the incident, Lana went to Lex Barker while he was sleeping. She pulled a gun on him. She put it up to his head, but she couldn't pull the trigger. You know, as much as she wanted to blow this man's brains out for what he did to her daughter, she couldn't do it. Wow. So, you know, uh, they obviously were divorced. And it's funny, when Barker died, he died kind of young at 54 in 1973, I I think. 
Lana simply said, and it's my favorite line, she just simply said, it wasn't soon enough. Well, that says it all. That right? says it all, yep. yeah. So she went on to husband number five, <laughs> who's Fred May. Lana was not to be discouraged in the marriage department. No, she was very optimistic. <laughs> she was it? very optimistic. But she did. She married a, a guy named Fred May, who was a rancher and a businessman. And from what everybody said and what I've, uh, I could find out through research, a really good guy. And nobody really knows why they divorced. There wasn't problems or weren't in the press. So he just kind of came and went. And, you know, this by now, it's, you know, the, the early 60s. And uh, it just uh, dissolved, you know, after a couple of years. Then came her probably worst two marriages. As she got older. As she got older. Uh, you know, not wanting to be alone, I think, is probably the reason for these last two. She married, in 1965, a guy named Robert Purdy Eaton. And Lana was only 44, which back then was considered oh she was old yeah the the bloom was off the rose and now 44 yeah, is just getting started yeah 44 is younger than jennifer aniston I exactly mean, that's like, i know, you know think about that i know it's crazy yeah that's crazy Robert Purdy Eaton, he was 10 years her junior, so she robbed the cradle. She got her a younger man. Yeah, and, baby. Uh, and the funny thing about him is is he was kind of a gold digger. You know, Cheryl Crane also said in her autobiography that he just was interested in, in her money. That's all. Again, short-lived. Uh, they were married, I think, four years. And then, you know, immediately she, well, after a few years, she moved on to her last husband, who was Ronald Dante, was his stage name. And I say stage name because they met while he was performing as a hypnotist at a place called the Candy Store, which was a, a really hot spot in Beverly Hills back in the day. Wow. That would give me pause right there before dating anybody who <laughs> was a hypnotist who working the, at the Candy Store. Who wants to date a hypnotist? <laughs> Apparently Lana. Yes. <laughs> and he was so not her type. He had long hair. He rode a motorcycle. Uh, you know, really the, the bad boy image. Yeah, well, well, Lana fell hard, so they got married in 69. You know, the ink was probably not even dry from the husband number six's divorce, but she married him, and he turned out to be a total fraud. This guy was just the worst. In her own biography, Lana wrote that, she, that he stole about a hundred grand from her, stole jewelry, and also, you know, just defrauded her for all this money. Uh, she sued him. She was awarded some money, but, you know, in later years, he ended up going to prison for making false claims about these shady businesses he started. I think oh. he had a, a permanent makeup business and then a paralegal school. So he was just shady he as could be. Kind of all over the place. Yeah. yeah. And ahead of his time with the permanent makeup. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> just to finish off, Lana, we, we mentioned Johnny Stompanato. Tell us what happened. Oh, there. right. And Johnny Stompanato was, you know, a, a big mobster. You know, I, and there's no other way to say it. You know, he was just part of the, the mob of, the, of that era. And he and Lana had a very, very passionate affair. He was her boyfriend. They never married. They never married married and he was extremely jealous. Um, you know, there's one incident, um, which I, I don't think I wrote in the blog, but she was making a movie with Sean Connery. And I can't think of the name of the movie off the cuff. It was on location. Johnny Stampanato showed up, got himself on set and pulled a gun on Sean Connery because he was convinced that they were having an affair. Wow. So Sean Connery fought with, you know, the monster and literally wow. took the gun away from him, uh, which, you know, it's one of the many incidences where probably probably the downward spiral of that relationship. Yes. But yes. I think the real end came in 1958. Lana got nominated for an Oscar for Peyton Place, her one and only, and she opted not to take Johnny to the Oscar ceremony. And this pissed Johnny off. Well, who did no she take? I don't know. Okay. That's a good question. Okay. Yeah. 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 But she didn't take her she boyfriend. She didn't take Johnny. Well, you know, sometime after that, Johnny basically attacked her in their house uh, in Beverly Hills. And to put an end to this very violent fight, daughter Cheryl, who I think was 16 or 17 at the time, ended up stabbing Johnny and killing him. And it was, you know, it was declared justifiable homicide. And, you know, Cheryl was not charged, but there was a very sensational trial that, that happened. And it was, you know, it was in all the gossip magazines. And it, you know, really was, was one of the more scandalous events in Lana's life. I remember hearing about that much later after it happened and thinking... It was almost like the screenplay for Mildred Pierce. The yes. screenwriter was prescient in knowing that story because it's a yes. very similar story. Oh, it story. is. It really is. Yeah. Talk to us about Ava Gardner. Oh, well, it's funny because, you know, and I'll kind of tie it into Lana because Lana and Ava had so much in common. You know, they came from very humble beginnings. You know, Ava grew up in, you know, 
poor girl from North Carolina. Lana grew up in Idaho before moving to Hollywood. And they were friends. And they were friends. They were very good friends. And, and you know, they both were exquisitely beautiful and probably had limited talent. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. They, they in were, terms of their on-screen they, capabilities. Yeah, they were more, they were definitely more known for their beauty than their hardcore acting skills. Right. But who cares? Just look at right. them. No Sophie's Choice in their No resume. Sophie's Choice. But between them, they shared a husband in Artie Shaw. Lana dated two of Ava's husbands, Mickey Rooney and Frank Sinatra. Oh, wow. Um, Ava dated one of Lana's husbands, Stephen Crane. And they both, at one time or another, dated Turhan Bay, Peter Lawford, Robert Taylor, Fernando Lamas, and Howard Hughes. So they were very, very connected, Ava wow. and Lana. However, in Lana Turner's autobiography... She claims that she and Sinatra were only friends. And Ava's first marriage to Mickey Rooney, this sort of gave me insight into Mickey Rooney in a way that I you don't see on the screen. Yes. Mickey Rooney was a horn dog. There's no other way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> he loved the ladies. He married eight times himself. And he was a huge star during Oh, this he time. was the number one box office star at MGM when he and Ava met. Um, he was doing the very famous Andy Hardy movies where he played the golly gee whiz. Boy Next Door, Andy Hardy, who was all, you know, sweet and, you know, all Americana. Uh, but, you know, he was, you know, a wild party man behind the scenes. He was so the opposite of, of Andy Hardy. But he met Ava while he and Judy Garland were shooting um, the great movie Babes in Arms. And Ava had just been signed under contract at MGM. And they were giving her a tour of the lot. And they stumbled on the soundstage where Judy and Mickey were filming. Well, Mickey at the time was doing a funny number where he was dressed up in drag looking like Carmen Miranda. Uh Ah. That's how Ava Gardner met Mickey Rooney. <laughs> and he made a beeline for her and he wooed her, you know, until finally they were married in 1942. She was 19. He was 21. So they were young. But the thing is, Mickey Rooney was a property. He was an MGM property. And they actually had to go to Louis B. Mayer and get permission to marry. Wow. Uh, and, you know, they finally convinced him. But he did say, I don't want to ruin the innocent image of Andy Hardy. So you have to get married out of town. It can't be a big to do. You can't invite the press. So they literally snuck off to the sleepy town up north near Santa Barbara, I think called Ballard, um, and they got married. But unfortunately, the marriage didn't last long enough to ruin anybody's image. You know? <laughs> it was it was short-lived. <laughs> and they really didn't date that long either, right? Uh, it was pretty quick. It was pretty quick. I yeah. mean, he had his sight set on Ava and he married her. So, it, you know, he did fine, married seven more times, including Martha Vickers, the great actress. Um, but, you know, Ava, she rebounded with Howard Hughes, which is a story all of himself. You could write a whole podcast about Howard Hughes and who all he dated. Right. But, you know, when he was with Ava, you know, it was it was tumultuous. It was sexy. It was passionate. I mean, they really had some, you know, they were like combustible energy. You know, they, they argued, they fought. You know, one particular argument, he ended up dislocating Ava's jaw. <gasps> Ava, she was such a tough cookie, you know, rather than cry or scream or anything like that, she... Or she, call the police. Or call the police, as she <laughs> should have. Exactly. What, what does she do? She she takes an ashtray and she knocks him over the head and knocks him unconscious. That's how she fought back. She didn't know what to do. So she called Louis B. Mayer and he said, you know, I think I've killed Howard Hughes. What do I do? So Louis B. Mayer sends over his henchmen. You know, they clean up the room. They make sure Howard's not dead. You know, Howard recovers. And so what does Howard do when he recovers? He proposes to Ava. Well, come on, Steve. Wouldn't you do that? <laughs> so that's such a courting ritual. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping... Oh, she said no, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was hoping for that. Um, before we get into more of Ava Gardner, let's jump into this week's Hollywood Pop Quiz. Yes. You know, talking about webs of love and marriages, um, musical comedy star Ethel Merman was married four times. Who was the famous third husband to whom she was only married for 38 days? 38 days. Okay, again. Short and sweet. Maybe not so sweet. No Googling allowed. We'll give you the answer at the end of today's episode. And now, another stop on the Hollywood tour. Did you know the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood from 1915 to 1934 was a woman, Frances Marion? Marion started her career writing exclusively for Mary Pickford. She won two Academy Awards for writing The Big House in 1930 and The Champ in 1932. At the height of her career, she was making $50,000 a year, which today would be equivalent to about $1.2 million a year. Now, back to Steve and Ann. 
So I recently saw a production of a play about Ava Gardner at the Geffen Playhouse oh, uh, right. in Westwood. And Artie Shaw is featured prominently in this production. Tell us about Artie Shaw and Ava Gardner. Ava and Artie. Well, yeah, Artie Shaw was hubby number two. You know, they were introduced by a mutual friend. You know, he had just come back from the war. He was a big war hero. He was a popular band leader in town. Uh, you know, he was a, a man about town. Uh, but it, it was kind of love at first sight. They, they really... For both of them. They both kind of fell for each other pretty hard. You know, it was a short courtship. They, they married um, in 1945 at Shaw's Beverly Hills mansion. Um, Ava was 22. Shaw was 35. Okay. A <laughs> little bit of an age gap there. Especially when you're that young. Yeah. But, you know, the same thing happened. You know, the problem with Lana Turner's marriage to Artie Shaw, Artie was an intellectual. He wanted an intellect. And Ava was not. Ava was just not educated formally. You know, she wasn't interested in, in the politics and the world events and the things that he wanted her to be interested in. So it was really a big wedge between them. And it seems like Artie has a problem because he keeps picking women that he feels like he wants to make over. Yeah. As opposed to just letting them be who they are. Exactly. I think he he chose with his eyes <laughs> rather than that his makes sense. heart and his feelings sense. and all the other things that go with it. So, you know, they divorced the following year. They weren't married long at all, uh, but they did remain friends for the rest of their lives. They, they did stay pretty tight. You know, in between... Artie and the next husband, who was the big one, um, you know, she dated a lot. This, you know, she really was the bachelorette around town. She, she you know, she dated the Robert Walker, who was that incredible, tragic actor who most people know from um, Strangers on a Train, Hitchcock's Strangers oh, on a Train. Yes. You know, he was still licking his wounds from his divorce from Jennifer Jones. He and Jennifer had come up together as young contract players, and Jennifer, <laughs> she married up. She basically dumped him for David Oselznick, the, the, very famous, very wealthy uh, producer. The one right. who produced Gone with the Wind and, and so forth. So Jennifer didn't look back. No, 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 <laughs> she didn't. And probably started working even more. And changed her name from Phyllis Isley to Jennifer Jones and became a star. So, you know, but poor Robert Walker, I don't think he ever got over her. But he dated Ava. You know, it, it didn't last, but she, they dated. And, you know, she also dated Van Heflin, another oh, yeah. great actor who, who I really love. Uh, and she also dated Greg Boutzer, who we talked about was Lana's boyfriend, who who stood her up, which started the whole marriage go round with Artie Shaw. So it's also connected. So weird. And also Greg Boutzer, just to kind of connect it, was also Howard Hughes's lawyer. So even if not in love, it's all connected. I wonder if Ava and Lana talked on the phone and said, I'm thinking about going out with Greg Boutzer. What do you think? Could and you she's imagine? Like, Stay away. Could you imagine their girl talk? <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. That would be that. That's There's a play. A play. There's your play. There you go. All right, exactly. Get on that. Steve. Lana and Ava, the Girl Talk. Yeah, Girl Talk. It's a great title. <laughs> well, you know, after that, after, you know, the Bachelorette days for Ava, then she married Frank Sinatra. That was the, oh, the big one. Oh, I'm sorry. One. Who's that? <laughs> a little, little singer, a little skinny singer from yeah, New Jersey, right. I think we've heard of. But she knew Frank already because Frank had dated Lana back in the day. So she knew of him socially. But they didn't really start dating until after uh, her divorce from Artie Shaw. It was quite a scandal when they got together because Frank was still married to that long-suffering wife of his, Nancy, poor thing. You know, the he first was Nancy. The first, the big Nancy, they call her. Big Nancy was... What did they call the other Nancy? Little Nancy. Okay. Yeah. I didn't I didn't realize that. Okay. Um, so, so he's married. He's married. And he's dating. He's not even oh. having an affair. He's dating and Ava not, e not even trying to hide it. They're out in the press. Wow. They're at the nightclubs. They're photographed together. Well, meanwhile, big Nancy is back home with two kids and a, and a newborn. Right. So, and this is not helping Frank's career. Not I would helping Frank's career. But, you know, Ava and Frank, they just couldn't be apart. They were combustible together. Together, um, you know, but they were very much alike. They were both very stubborn and hot-headed and passionate, uh, which I think helped their relationship and ultimately probably destroyed it. Sure. You want that yin and yang, yes. right? To make yeah. it last. And when they did get married, you know, Ava was at the zenith of her career where Frank was kind of, his career was waning a little bit. You know, he wasn't quite as popular as he was. We forget that his career really did have a downward spiral. Yes. And she actually well, helped him, She right? absolutely helped him get the second act of his career. You know, there was a little book called <laughs> From Here to Eternity. Oh. Which everyone knows. And they 
when they made it into a film in 1953, Frank Sinatra knew that he was the perfect guy to play Maggio. You know, the, the funny Italian guy who's Montgomery Cliff's friend who ultimately meets the tragic end, but nobody in town would see him. And prior to that, he really hadn't done a dramatic role, right? No, he, he was all musicals and comedies exactly. and guys and dolls and fun, fluffy stuff like that. This was a real meaty mm-hmm. part he could sink his teeth into. Yeah. Well, you know, nobody would see him. So Ava, who was so at the heights of her fame and power, she used her power. She called up her friends. She called up the studio head and she made them see him for the role and he booked it. Wow. Which, of course... Yay, Ava. Yeah, Ava, stand by your man. But, you know, he ultimately won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for the role. Um, also, Donna Reed won the Best Supporting Actress for the role, too, in also the same movie. So it really gave him a, a second act of his career. Sure, yeah. yeah. So during the period that Ava was dating Frank Sinatra, she was not exactly pure as the driven <laughs> snow, right? She was perhaps seeing somebody else as well? Well, <laughs> I guess what's good for the good is good for the gander, <laughs> Ava thought, because she was dating Sinatra, but she also had an onset romance with Robert Mitchum, the, the great Robert Mitchum. They were shooting a movie together in 53 called My Forbidden Past, which um, nobody that... nobody remembers. <laughs> well, but how appropriate, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very apropos <laughs> <Yes>. named. <laughs> But you know, the problem with that romance, though, which maybe this was a pattern with Ava, but um, Mitchum was married to his long-suffering wife, Dorothy. (laughs) So there's a little pattern growing here. right? And so, you know, Mitchum was very much like Ava. He was hard living, hard drinking, you know, rebellious guy. So they were kind of perfect. Ava kind of was pretty smitten with him. She really liked him. And she even proposed to him. Can you imagine Ava Gardner proposing to Robert Mitchum? And him saying no. Well, he didn't exactly say no. Okay. He said... (laughs) He said, all right, Ava, if you want to marry me, you first have to ask Dorothy. <laughs> so that she did. The best answer ever. Well, at, well, Ava, not to be deterred, she went to Dorothy and they had a, a girl talk. And, and what so, did Dorothy say? Well, you know, the next day, Mitchum asked that question. He said, how did it go with Dorothy? You know, Ava just simply said, Dorothy said no. <laughs> And Robert Mitchum and Dorothy ended up being married for 57 years? 57 years. Well, you know, I think it's good that he thought that they could have a conversation. (laughs) Maybe that shows how strong their marriage was. Yes. And I think Dorothy Mitchum is probably a saint. (laughs) Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. So Sinatra and Ava, even though the marriage didn't last, the friendship did. It did. They stayed friends to the end, to the bitter end. So although Ava didn't marry anyone after Frank Sinatra, she did have a number of prominent relationships. One in particular, well, first of all, Peter O'Toole, hello, yes. who I ran into <laughs> at the Shutters Hotel in oh. Santa Monica, and I wanted to just sit yeah. down and chat with him. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. But the other was Oscar-winning actor George C. Scott. Yes, very volatile relationship, those two. You know, and, and sort of an odd match, if you, in my opinion. You know, I don't know. He's so intense and she's such the fun-loving party girl. They, they, but it was very rocky. It was it was a really volatile relationship. They fought also, like Howard Hughes. He was a fighter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was one incident that was very famous that got covered in the press at the Savoy Hotel in London. The fight got so bad that he hit her and dislocated her jawbone. Oh, my Then word. he threatened to kill her and her assistant with a broken liquor bottle. So Ava and the assistant hide out in the bathroom. They lock themselves in the hotel bathroom. You know, they're terrified. You know, he's on a rant and a rage and outside in the room. And clearly an alcoholic. Totally alcoholic. So finally, (laughs) Ava, being the smart girl that she is, she crawls out the the window of the bathroom and she goes for help. (laughs) Wow. But still, that did not deter George C. Scott. He was so obsessed with her. He would just show up on movie sets unannounced, and he would follow her and kind of stalked her for for many, many years to the point where Ava actually called her ex, Frank Sinatra, who may or may not have had mobster ties. We're not sure. We don't know. (laughs) Allegedly. But she told Frank that that he was bothering her, and uh, Frank put an end to it. Frank sent some men to have a little talk with George C. Scott, and he never bothered Ava again. Wow. Would love to know what that little talk was. Like. I would love to know what that conversation was. Exes come in handy. <laughs> they do. They come in handy. And it sounds like she was able to have, even though they weren't married, a healthy friendship. Someone you can call when, <laughs> when somebody is 
beating you up. To, to move a body or to get your stalker off your back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think we could go on and on in this web of love. Um, Absolutely. You know, we... And in fact, if you check out the the blog, we also get into Rita Hayworth, who's another, you know, she's like the, the I, I consider it the three graces of the web of love. There's Lana, Ava, and Rita. Well, and, and Elizabeth Taylor, which we don't even get say, into. We, we won't even go to Elizabeth Taylor. But check Taylor. out the blog post at from beneath the Hollywood sign.com and read all about Rita. And before we go, let's give the answer to our Hollywood pop quiz. So if you recall, the question was, musical comedy star Ethel Merman was married four, four times. times. And her third husband was a very famous person. And the marriage only lasted 38 days days. What is the answer? <laughs> Who is this famous person? All right. Try to imagine this couple, Ethel Merman and Ernest Borgnine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Do we they, know why it only lasted 38 days? Well, it's funny. In Ernest Borgnine's autobiography, he talks about it and he said that on their honeymoon, they traveled abroad and Ethel became furious that everybody recognized him and nobody recognized her. And it was the ultimate beginning of the end of their marriage. And so 38 days later, they were divorced. And funny enough, in Ethel Merman's autobiography, she has a chapter that's dedicated to Ernest Borgnine, and it's a blank page. That's why they always say to get to know somebody, you should travel with them, right? (laughs) Yes. Even Anne Rutherford, my fairy godmother, was not immune to the interconnections of Hollywood. Anne's second husband was Batman producer William Dozier, who was married to Rebecca Starr, Joan Fontaine, who was married to TV producer Collier Young, who was once married to actress director Ida Lupino, who was married to actor R- Howard Duff, who was married to actress Gloria DeHaven, who was married to John Payne, who was married to actress Anne Shirley, and it goes on and on and on. Can you give our listeners our email address if they have any questions or comments? If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Please email us at info at fronbeneaththehollywoodsign.com. That's a wrap on episode three. Thanks for listening. That's this week's view. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. You've been listening to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign with Steve Kubine and Ann McNamara, the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of Tinseltown from its golden era. Join us next week for another episode and learn something else about Hollywood you probably never knew. Take a moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive review. And tell your friends about us, too. It'll help grow the podcast. Visit Steve's website at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com. The executive producers are Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara. Executive producer and post-production supervisor, Lindsay Schneble. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit AirwaveMedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schneble and Toth. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. That's a wrap.